So if you guys can open your Bibles up to Psalm 119, we will be carrying on what we started last, two weeks ago, Dennis started the first section of this psalm, short psalm, and we will be carrying on today. I'm not going to give a long introduction to the psalm because Dennis did a very well job introducing the psalm and how it's written out and laid out. There it is, back behind me, you can see. But before we read it and before I dive into it, as I know some of us love stories, I know. <laughs> I got a little st- story I will read to you guys. And it's actually from a book that I've uh, started a while ago, never finished it, came back to it in the past two weeks, and it's, it's an awesome book. This is not a conference where they sell and advertise books, but I'm going to take the moment to advertise this book. <laughs> it's by Randy, Randy Alcorn, and it's Purity, uh, Purity Principle. So really good book, very simple read. And I will read to you guys a story that's here in the beginning. No surprise, today we'll be talking about purity. That's going to be the topic. So chapter one, this is how it starts off, and it's really pretty cool. So Eric stormed into my office and flopped in a chair. I'm really mad at God. Having grown up in a strong church family, he'd met, a Mary, uh, he met and married a Christian girl. Now he was in a, a picture of misery. Okay, why are you mad at God, he asks. Because, he said, last week I committed adul- adultery. Long pause, finally I said, I can see why God would be mad at you, but why are you mad at God? Eric explained, for several months he's felt a strong mutual attraction with a woman at his office. He prayed earnestly that God would keep him from my morality. So I asked him, did you ask your wife to pray for you? And did you stay away from the woman? Well, no. We went to lunch almost every day. Slowly I started pushing a big book across my desk. Eric watched uncomprehending as this book inched closer and closer to the edge. I prayed out loud, Oh Lord, please help uh, keep this book from falling. And I kept pushing and praying. God didn't suspend the law of gravity. The book went straight over the edge and smacked into the floor. And I said, I'm mad at God. I asked him to keep my book from falling, but he let me down. That's just a little introduction to get your mind flowing, what we're going to be talking about today. But and as we dive into the section that we're going to begin, uh, I will read to you, 9 through 16, Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Big topic, purity. How can a young man keep his way pure? God commands purity and forbids impurity. So that is to say purity is right and purity is wrong. True? Absolutely. Purity equals smart, and you can finish in purity equals not smart. <laughs> not, not sometimes, but always. God, by nature, he's a, a rewarder. Let's see if I can do this. Wow. In Hebrews 11.6, it says, And without faith, faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. God will reward us for making the right choices to please Him. Obedience to His will and His ways will lead us to a most wonderful human condition, which is joy. i say this again to you. Obedience to His will and His ways will lead us to the most wonderful human condition, joy. And we have the option to choose joy, peace, life, and hope, or we can choose the opposite, curses, misery, scars, like Deuteronomy. 30 says, is it working? Nice. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offsprings may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to give to them. He gives us the options. You choose what you want. You want blessings, you want joy, or you want curses, and you want misery. 
we have that option. Cain, I mean, Dennis already brought it up today. We, we kind of touched the to uh, topic of Cain in, in uh, Genesis. He, he was at a crossroads. He was standing at crossroads in uh, Genesis chapter 4, verses uh, 6 and 7. It says, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. God was saying to him, If you choose my plan, you will find happiness. Yes, this is a fallen world, but if you say no to your sinful desires that want to take control over you, and if you want to choose to walk with God, you will experience peace. Cain was at this crossroads. Sadly, he didn't choose the right way. When God calls us to pursue purity, we're not asked to do something that will deprive us of our joy and make us miserable. No, we're actually being called to do what will bring us the greatest joy, the greatest happiness. God commands to flee youthful passions. I'm sure you guys all know this verse, 2 Timothy 2.22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. God calls us to flee from it, run away from it, like Joseph ran away from, from that woman. Run away from youthful passions and pursue what is right. 1 Timothy 6, 11, and 12. But as for you, O man, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about to which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That's what we're called to do. We're called to purity, but why? That's the question. Why do we have to be pure? This is my body. I do what I want, right? <laughs> no, we're called to purity, and there's a reason for it. And there's a verse to back that up, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not of your own, for you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. That is why we have to be pure. When we come to Christ, the title of our life is transferred to Him. Just as most of us here are Russian and we buy cars at auctions, so when we buy a car, car at an auction, we show up there, we pick up the car, and we get the title. The car belongs to us. We pay the price for the car. Similarly here, except a lot more precious price was paid for our life by cross, uh, on the cross by Christ. And now our life belongs to him. Christ's blood bought us. We are his by creation and again by redemption. He has the right to tell us what to do with our body. He has the right to tell us what to do with our life. He has the right to tell us to remain pure for him. God takes purity seriously. And then this question is posed. In Psalm 119, verse 9. And it's a good question. And it's a question worth answering. How can we keep our way pure? And the easy part is, the question is answered right away. Verse 2. I mean, same verse, continuing part 2. By guarding it according to your word. John 15, 3. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken into you. So we become clean according to the word that Christ speaks to us. I mean, I'm just going to jump a little bit ahead. In verse 11, said, I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. So it's God's word is what protects us. It's what keeps us clean. It's what keeps us pure. Word of God is power, and it is God's power against sin. God wants us to have his word in our hearts that we may not sin, that we can be clean. That way we can gain the strength through the word that he gives us and fight the temptations. It is not an easy task. And the author answers the question with a satisfying answer, like I just read, by guarding it according to your word. It is the power to keep you clean. God's word is the power. It is the power against temptation. If someone's complaining because they're constantly failing, like Eric came into his room and he was complaining because he failed, the answer to that is, it's because they're not in the word sufficiently. So if someone's com complaining that they're constantly failing is because they're not in the word sufficiently. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. He must be in the word. I mean, we have a perfect example in the scriptures, in uh, Matthew chapter 4. It's not going to be up there. Perfect example is Jesus, we all know the story, when he was in the desert for 40 days, he was tempted by Satan. But how did he answer all the time when Satan would propose some kind of temptation? He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. He knew God's word. It was it was with him always. It was in his heart. He knew it, and that's how he answered temptation, and that is how we are supposed to. We need to have God's word in our heart. That way we may be able to withstand 
temptation that Satan throws our way. What ruins young people is either living by no rules at all and no authority or coming up with their own rules. And it's, it's the age that we live in right now. It's, if this is me, it's all about me, satisfy me, everyone love me. Have no, uh, no regard at all for authority, for the scripture, what we're called to be, how we're called to live our life. So seeing that he needs to have God's word in his, in his life, he, he moves on. He says, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. He seeks God. He knows he needs to have God in his, in his heart, so he looks for him. He seeks for him. Deuteronomy 4.29 But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. God says that when we seek him with our whole heart and our whole soul and our whole human being, we will find him. So a couple of rhetorical questions for you. How are we seeking God? Is it only when it's hard, when we encounter some hard hardships in our life? Or is it every day? Do we come to him, you know, like Dennis said last week, no breakfast, no Bible, or no Bible, no breakfast. Something along those lines. Do we seek Him every day, or is it only when things are hard, it's like, oh, wait, I can pray to God and get some help. It is important for us to be aware of our dependency to wander. And the more we are finding pleasure in keeping God's commandments, the more we are afraid to wander from them. And the more earnest our prayer will be to God for His grace to, pre to, pre to prevent us from wandering. Basically, to sum it up, the more we read, the more we see our state the more we see our dependence on Christ and the more we pray to Him to keep us away from wandering and from sinning against Him. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Other translations say, I've checked them out, and they say, I have hid your, your word in my heart, laid it up in my heart that I may be ready to use for any occasion. That way, not to sin is to treasure, to store up God's word in our heart. It's always there, which means a way to reach our ultimate goal in life, which our ultimate goal in life is to be with Christ, to be in heaven, to enjoy him forever, is to treasure his word in our hearts now. Your word, God's written word, or at the time, Torah, when this was written, or you know, maybe they had a couple of prophet books out already, but writing these words, commandments, statutes, ordinances, testimonies, precepts, are all the words that the Bible uses referring to written word of God. These days, today, if we say your word, we mean the Bible, the scripture, the written word of God. And verse 11 is not just, you know, subjective or impressions that, you know, things that are only thought about, only in the mind, but it's actually objective teachings of God. And scripture meaning real reality existing teachings that are real. They are the real word I have stored up in my heart, which leads us to my heart meaning inside of me, not just written somewhere, written on a table, or it's just some kind of thinking place. No, it is written in our heart, because in our heart there's a place for thinking and for feeling. And Genesis 6.5 says this, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord saw the wickedness and thoughts that were in the heart, and they were only evil. Or feelings like Job 36.13, The godless in heart cherish anger. They do not cry for help when he blinds them. Anger is a feeling, so they treasured anger in, in their hearts. So we know when Psalmist says, I have stored up in the heart, does not mean just values the word or understands that it's important, but he hides it in his heart. He holds it as something treasurable, something that's valuable, like a true treasure. So one way to keep us from sinning, to answer one of those questions, is to live for the glory of God, and enjoy Him forever. It's to store up God's Word in our hearts as something precious. When we have the Word stored in our hearts and we treasure it as gold or diamonds, the Word will function to keep us from sinning. Thus, these things keep us from sinning, not just having the Word, but also valuing it. They both work together, like uh, epoxy glue. You guys all know that, right? If you don't, it comes in two little tubes, you squeeze them both out, you mix it out, bam, glue. If you separate the tubes and you squeeze them out here, squeeze them out here, try to glue things separate, it's just going to make a gooey mess. It's not going to perform its function as the glue is supposed to do. Or another example, you have a car and you have gasoline. You have this huge tank of gas and you have a car with no gas, no tank of gas. Your goal is to get to Los Angeles, let's say. You will sit on this gas tank forever. You will not get to LA because it won't get you there. The gas alone will not get you there. Or you can get you and your friends to sit in this car, gasless car, 
Pretend you're driving, but you won't get there until you combine the two, until you combine the gas in the car, and then you get to your goal. Or even something visual right now that you can see. Behind me, there's instruments right now, right? They're not playing anything because they're just instruments on their own. There's no music being produced. There's band members out here sitting in the front. They're not producing music either because they don't have the instrument. But when you combine the band member and the music, you get music. Amen. There it is. So you've got to have both parts. You've got to understand it, and you've got to value it, and then it'll perform its function to keep you from sinning. So what's the best way to store up God's word in our heart? Then it becomes the question, because it's like, all right, well, I've got to have God's word in my heart to win temptations to remain pure. How do I do it? The answer is quite simple. Memorize it. Um, just like, this may be not the greatest example, but just like bears, before they hibernate, right? They, they eat up, they get fat, and then they go to sleep so they can survive through the winter season and wake up and live again. Similarly, until we get to heaven, we've got to store up in biblical fatness so we can survive and get there. Because if we don't, we'll be falling into temptations. So how many verses... Wait. Yeah, God says His Word is more desired than gold. It is sweeter than honey. That's in Psalm 19. So how many verses would you memorize for, say, $100 per verse? You know, like if someone just came up to you and said, hey, I'll give you $100 if you memorize a verse, how many would you memorize? I'm pretty sure most of us would quit our jobs and become <laughs> full-time memorizing verses. I mean, I, I can honestly say that, you know. So then what is our motivation then? Here, here we go. I just brought up some money and everyone lit up. Ooh, 100 bucks? <laughs> How can I make 100 bucks? Memorize a verse? Cool. What is our motivation then? We're talking about sinning, uh, staying away from sin and remaining pure. What is our motivation? We want to be in heaven with Christ. We want to be pure for Christ. Is it money or purity is what's going to drive us? We know Christ had uh, scripture memorized verbatim. We know this because when he was tempted in the wilderness... Like I talked about a little while ago, there were no Bibles to you know, look up real quick when Satan's tempting. He's like, hey, hold on that thought. Let me just... No, he didn't have that. He didn't have no Torahs. He didn't have no iPhones, no iPads, nothing. He didn't have no desktop or computer to refer to. He definitely didn't have an Android. And uh, he had it written in his heart. He had it, he had it memorized. He, he knew it verbatim. And that's why he was able to, as soon as the temptation come, came up, he was just like, bam, it is written. It is written. It is written. And I will just point it out to you guys. That's Matthew chapter 4, verses 4, 7, and 10. This is how he answered. That's the right place. There we go. Chapter 4. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the word, uh, mouth of God. Verse 7. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written. Verse 9. Sorry, it was verse 9, not 10. And he said to him, all these will be given to you if you... No. No, that's Satan. Jesus replies in verse 10, for it is written. So he's always coming back to a scripture because he hasn't memorized verbatim. It is written. We need to read God's word and memorize it and store it up. Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Word of God is the sword of the spirit. We cannot defeat sin without a sword. Just like people don't go to battle without a weapon. I've never seen it. Nope, I skipped it probably. This is where <laughs> technology and myself are not friendly. So Ephesians 6, 17, I'll read it to you again. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Word of God is a sword of the Spirit. Like I said, nobody goes to battle without a weapon. Never in you know history class when I was studying some history, they never showed pictures of you know civil war and people are just running at each other bare hands. No, they always had a gun, a machete, or something. People always go with something. So what helps us fight sin is word of God. It is our sword. It is our dagger. We stab sin away with it. Flee from me. You lost. So the only way to win is to have the God's word stored up in our heart, memorized with us. So psalmist, he realizes this. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. And that leads them to worship. He's like, blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. You're blessed, O Lord. Knowing that God is already complete in himself, he doesn't need anything from us. He complete, and we become complete in him. The author prays here, 
and he mixes praise in here. And this is how we should be praying to God. Praise him for the fact that he accepted us. It is not of anything that we can do or did. He's already complete. So realizing that, he says, next line, teach me your statutes. Teach me your rules. He realized that in order not to sin, he needs to have God's word in his heart. So where else better to learn than from the source? So the author begs here to be taught. He's desperate to be taught by this creator, God. A way not to sin is to have God's word commandments stored up. So before he stores them, he needs to know them. Just like when we, uh, I'm sure most of us have been to college or some of us are still in like high school, maybe middle school. When we do research, we go to the source, right? When we study something, we don't just take something that someone said, oh yeah, yeah, okay, cool, I'll write it down and quote this guy. No, you go to the source, you find out where, the, where the, the facts are actually at. So this is what the psalmist is doing here. Teach me your statutes. He comes to God and he says, teach me, because I want to know from you, because you made these rules. And this is how we got to do it as well. we got to come to God's word, memorize it, be, have it become part of us. And this, this will lead us to verse 13, when it becomes part of us. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. He, with this, he shows how saturated he was with God's word. He was full of it. And it pours out of him. He was happy with it and how much he delighted in it. And then we go to Luke 6.45. Ah, okay. 6.45, there we go. Luke 6.45. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil out of the evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So my question is this then to you. How saturated are you with God's word? How much of God's word do you have stored up in your heart? Interestingly here, the author, after storing God's word in his heart, he doesn't just leave it in there on a long-term keep. It's not just, you know, store away forever. It's not a little storage shack that you have. It pours out of him. And it's like in Matthew, I don't have a verse for this written up there, but Jesus is talking about a master of the house that takes out all the treasures of his house, new and old. And in verse 12, I'm going to go back here. He says, teach me that I can make use of this knowledge. That in verse 13, he goes and he teaches. It's like he learns something. Now he can't hold it in anymore. He explodes with this passion. He goes and spreads it to the people surrounding him. He comes right back to us. When we study God's word, do we just pray that God reveals himself to us and teach us? And when we do find that gold nugget, when God does reveal something to us, we find it, do we just store it up to ourselves and like, oh, cool, now I got something, now I'm not going to tell anyone, it's mine. No, it's exactly the opposite. We, we call up our friends, we text them the, the verses that we really like, and we share it with them because it's pouring out of us because we're filled with this joy. It's the same example. I mean, I tried this several times, haven't yet won, but... If we win the lotto, right, you know, 72 million or something, I'm not going to be holding it in myself and just say, oh, cool, I got 72 million. No, I'm going to tell everyone. I'm going to tell all my friends, hey, come and rejoice with me because I, I won this. Or we have even examples in the scripture, in um, parables, when the lost coin was found. What did the, the lady do? She didn't just, you know, turn off the lights and go to sleep. No, she called up all of her friends, hey, come rejoice with me. I found the coin. Or when the sh lost sheep was found and he was coming back to town, the town was ready for him. Everyone celebrates. So that is how it should be when we, when we find God's truth and we study it. It's got to pour out, out of us unto others and we've got to share it with people. It should be like that in our Christian community. Spread the word, what God reveals to us, and treasure it. Those whose hearts are fed with the bread of life should with their lips feed many. Let me say that again. Those whose hearts are fed with the bread of life should with their lips feed many. He goes on to say, in the ways of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. Those who find pleasure in the ways of God are likely to preserve in them and store them and value them. Delight, we touch this word here in verse 14, delight, it's, it's a big word, it's a deep word, and it's to find the highest satisfaction. So the psalmist delights in the Lord's testimonies. His commandments bring him joy and satisfaction. This world has a lot to teach us on happiness, and I did some research online, and I found this book written by a guy, and it's called uh, Living the Good Life. 
And I'm sure there's many songs out there like that, One Republic. Um, and he answers a lot of questions. People ask him a lot of questions. So this guy traveled the whole world. He's been to every country and just to see how life is everywhere else. And he summed it up in his book, Living the Good Life. So he answers this question, what is happiness? He's just asked. And he answers it like this. He answers it apart from God because this guy is not a born-again Christian. He says, happiness is love, connection with others despite their flaws, it's loving yourself and life that you're living and loving the experience of life. And so on. He goes on and talking about smiling and bringing smiles to others and just being full of yourself. So I was, I was a little interested with this topic, what is happiness, what is delight, what brings you the highest level of satisfaction. So I asked some friends around and I just, don't worry if you are here and I asked you, this is totally anonymous, no one's going to know who said what. <laughs> But I summed up all the answers that I received, because if I told you every answer, it'd be too long, we'd be here forever. But I summed them up, categorized them, and basically, this is how it goes. Happiness is being surrounded by people of God, by youth groups. Some said it's when doing stuff you love with people you love. For example, like spreading God's word and, and, uh, to people surrounding us or having fellowship with the youth. Doing ministry and seeing positive results brings happiness. Not expecting anything in, re, in, re, in result also brings happiness. Many said that to do work for others, and that brings them the feeling of satisfaction. To some, it was seeing positive resor, results after hard work. Others, it was telling people about Christ brought them happiness. For some, it was just general guiding and teaching people, making an impact in someone's day or life. Happy to know when things are working out in life. Compliments bring us happiness. Looking good brings us happiness. When we're noticed, we like it. Being around people who are on the same page with us brings us happiness. We are happy when we worship together and see people experiencing Christ the same way we experience Him. And the last answer, I save this for last because it's like grand slam. Happiness is found in God. Seeing the work he does in our life through the salvation that he provided and finding highest satisfaction and delight in obeying his word. When I asked my dad this question, he answered with, uh, what makes me happy is what does not bring me sorrows. And that was it. I was like, ah, <laughs> you're full of wisdom. <laughs> but then he goes on and uh, he cites uh, 3 John 1 and 4, where John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. John says as a leader that what makes him most happy is seeing his children walk in truth. And psalmist here, he rejoices in the ways of God's testimonies. It is his will and what he wants from us. Those who find pleasures in the way of God are likely to proceed and to preserve in them. The people, uh, that person will dwell upon them and their thoughts will be in God's word. And that's where you'll find the highest joy and the highest satisfaction. And when you find the highest joy and the highest satisfaction in God's Word, as much as in all riches, what are you going to do with it? You will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will meditate on your precepts. The psalmist says here, I will meditate all the rules of your mouth. In verse 13, he soaks them up in his heart. He absorbs them. The precepts and the rules themselves, they become part of him. And God's word must be the very subject of our thoughts. Do we meditate on God's word? Or, you know, yeah, we go to church and believe that all things are you know, working out. But do we actually sink in and meditate in God's word when we read it? Do we, you know, meditate on his precepts, his law? When we do, we'll end up keeping his word. And then the things that we seek, you know, and then we will seek to walk in his ways. Our eyes will be fixed on him. We will live to please him with our walk. Our eyes will constantly be looking for Him, for His ways. We will find pleasure in obedience to Him. That's when we meditate on His precepts and fix our eyes on His ways. And before we move on, I have this quote for you. This is from uh, Resolve 2010, Steve Lawson. The more you please Him, it won't matter who you displease. But if you displease Him, it won't matter who you please. Let me say it again. The more you please Him, it won't matter who you will displease. But if you displease Him, it won't matter who you please. 
He hits the nail on the head right there. If we find our satisfaction and joy in Christ, we please Him, it won't matter what the rest of the world has to offer. All that will go away. We won't have the desire for it. But if we chase these little things over here, we'll never be able to please Him. We'll never be able to have that joy in Him. In the last verse, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. He delights in God's statutes. Not only meditate about them, not only think about them, but he finds the highest level of satisfaction in God's statutes and his rules. We already discussed this level. I already kind of t- talked about this, what brings you happiness, what do you delight in. But now I have an opportunity to ask you the question, and you have the opportunity to check yourself. What do you delight in? And what is the source of your happiness? What makes you the most happy? What do you find yourself complete in? What is the reason of your happiness? You know, in Christmas season, when that comes around, and that's right around the corner, Christians say, you know, Jesus is the reason for this season. And we hear it everywhere all the time. But it's not only in Christian se- uh, in Christmas season. Sorry, I said Christ- Christian season. Christmas season. It's not only in Christmas season that we should remember him and be happy and remember that he's the reason for everything. Yeah, it's a joyful time to remember when he came to this world and he was born and everyone's happy and the angels are all singing. It's great. But fast forward 33 years or so. And what happened then? He died on the cross for us and bought us and now we are his. Shouldn't that bring us more joy? Because it's nothing that we did. It's nothing that we deserve. But it's, and no place says it better than Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. It's nothing that we did, but it's God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that anyone may boast. Do we delight in that? Do we find joy in that? Does that bring us happiness? It is nothing that we did. It is nothing that we could do. It's only... Through Christ, by grace, we are saved and all of our, our sins He bore on that cross for us. Isaiah 53, 4-6 Surely He has bore our griefs and He carried our sorrows. Yes, we, yet we esteem Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with His wounds we are healed All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took it all upon himself on that cross on that day that we may find joy in him, that we can be full in him, that we can see him, and we should treasure that and find happiness in that, do we? Praise be to God for what he has done for us. And he, here's the great part, he's still waiting. Like if you have yet to experience this, if you have not accepted him, him, him in your heart, if you don't know what, you know, the past 30 minutes I've been standing up here and you're just sitting there like, what is he talking about? What is his joy and happiness in God's word? When is he done? When are we singing so we can go to Starbucks? If you haven't experienced this joy in Christ, if you haven't experienced this joy in reading his word and memorizing his word and memori- uh, meditating on his word, if you haven't experienced delighting in God's word, there's still time. God is still waiting. Pray to him. Let go of these momentary pleasures that this world has to offer and, and turn to the one that offers the fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611. You make, me, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there's fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Don't you want to experience that? Don't you want to have experience that pleasure to be there with Christ in heaven there's only one way, and it's a simple way. Christ did all the work. We read it in Isaiah. He, he bore all of our sins on that cross on that day. He did everything, so we don't have to do anything. And he extends it to us. He invites us, come, come to me, all you who are heavy with your labor, laden with your burdens, and I will give you rest. 
if you're thinking about this and you're concerned right now in your heart that you're not there, you're not experiencing Christ like you should, you don't have him, you don't have that assurance and salvation, I encourage you, you pray to him. As we finish, I will leave it open. Anyone can pray. You can pray and ask him to enter into your heart or you can pray and worship him and praise him for the fact that he's forgiven you and now you have life. Or if you're shy, you can come up to me or any of the leaders or you can come up to the pastor or the day here after the service and you can come and ask to pray with. While there's still time, for we don't know what, what is to come tomorrow, but praise be to Jesus for what he's done for us and the fact that he's still there waiting for us if you have not yet accepted him. Let's bow our heads and pray.